5.30 Eastern time, and we'll talk to him. Man, when I was on the air in Tampa with this dude, holy cow, was WDAE the most powerful radio station in the East Coast. Former Buccaneer and my friend, and I'll tell you what, I love his work. Ian Beckles joins us now. Ian, how you doing, big fella? I still got a bunch of your T-shirts, man. You gave me back in the day. I still got them T-shirts, dude. I'm doing well, brother. How you? You look good, man. Thank you, man. You too, man. How's it going, Ian? Life is good, bro. I'm 56 years old. I ain't no spring chicken no more. Um, you know, still involved with radio a little bit. I'm on the Bow 102.5. Do some stuff with Mike Calta and do podcasts. And I want to carve a bar and uh, keep myself busy, man. Hey, man, did we not kill it in Tampa on DA? Hey, well, I, look, I liked you and Ron. You know, the other guy in the afternoon, me and him never really got along. You know, God rest his soul, all this and that. But that day Chris Thomas before you guys, man, that was a really great time in radio, man, when we had that station doing 10 shares across the board. Yeah, that was a good time in the history of sports radio. I think it's fallen a little bit since. Uh, we, ha we had an unbelievable lineup. Um, the, the young man, uh, Steve Dooming, you're talking about in the afternoon, uh, I mean, like you said, rest in peace. I don't think he conducted himself uh, that he wanted to be too many people's friends. But uh, his radio was good. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was controversial. And, you know, we didn't kiss nobody's ass. That was beautiful. Absolutely. Ian, I want you to help me out on something here. Help me out on Devin White. There's some people in Philadelphia that are excited about him. And yet when I hear Sapp say this, he was lazy. The last five years have not been good. And the Bucks picked him at the fifth pick and just allowed him to walk out the room. Now, it's one thing to hear Sab say, you kind of take it with a small grain of salt, but one thing about Warren, he's got harsh criticism. Do you have the same criticism of Devin White? Well, I mean, I know Warren personally, and Warren uh, doesn't pull punches. Uh, and listen, he was a captain for the Buccaneers, so... You know, I, I think he understands the game of football, as we all do. Um, I don't think he said anything about Devin White that isn't the truth. Uh, Devin White is an unbelievable athlete. He's an unbelievable talent. I wouldn't say that the whole five year, years was a bust. He was a big reason why they won the Super Bowl. He was great that year. And Devin White has had periods where he looked fantastic. Now, if you ask me if Devin White is a great football player, I could not say he's a great football player. I can say he's an explosive football player with a lot of potential, but he's missing something. I don't know if it's a sports psychologist because there's sometimes he just doesn't seem like he remembers what he's doing, if that makes sense. Like, there's times he's just being blocked. The great ones are never blocked. You know that, Dan. Like, Derrick Brooks always knew where he was in the moment, and that's what I grew up seeing. And Devin White at times just kind of seems like he's going out for a Sunday stroll, so... Physically, mentally, I think physically he's all, he seems fine. Mentally, I think the kid needs some work. So he's an emotional player then, Ian. If things are going great, he's great. If things are going bad, maybe in his life, because last year, one thing I did notice, this guy at the beginning of the year, when he said he wanted a new contract, his, his market value was off the charts. And then all of a sudden, when things weren't going right with Jason Light, the general manager of the Bucks. I even talked to Bruce Arians about this and had him on the show. It just seemed that he went south the other way and things unraveled to the point, Ian, where he was benched at the end of the season. So, I mean, he's more emotional than anything, isn't it? Well, I think he thought his market value was much higher than it actually was. And listen, as athletes, we have, I have no problem with thinking somebody's worth more money than they are. And at the beginning of last year, if you had put him out in the open market, I don't think there would have been a bunch of people running to, to sign Devin White, to be honest with you. If Devin White would have had a solid year this year, I think he would have got paid a lot more than he did. He's just not a $20 million guy. There's not many middle linebackers in the league that are right now. I can think of a couple, and that's it. Devin's a serviceable football player. And listen, I used to be an Eagle as well. I claim to be a Buccaneer. I'm a Buccaneer until I die. But I wouldn't say the Eagles got a bust. I mean, if if his mind is right and he's and, and his body's right, you can get a good football player in Devin White. If but the, like I said, something was missing in Tampa Bay. 
he did he, he didn't play very inspired at times, and I wondered why. Um, you think a new like you said, Ian? Do you think a new zip code, maybe under Fangio in a new environment, kind of helps him out more with a new with a new uh, slate? And this is something that again they're gonna. But I looked today, I found out because Clint Hurt is a former Kane, and he's a former DC up in Seattle, and he's now the D line coach. And they're going to go to a 34. They're going to put him in a 34, which means he's got to play on a guard. So that means he's got to play the run. And, Ian, those numbers have not looked real good when it comes to playing against the run. Can he handle a 34? Uh, if you're asking me my vote, I would say no. I mean, if you say give me a 34 linebacker, Devin White wouldn't be the first one that comes to mind. You know, back in the day, that those 34 linebackers were in, you know, the Oak of Ray Lewis's and – Big Burley LeVon guys. Kirkland's, yeah, LeVon yeah. Kirkland kind of guys. Yeah, and you don't have to be huge guys. Sam Mills was a good inside yeah. linebacker who was a son of a bitch at like 5'9". But listen, Devin White, phys physicality is not really his thing. He's a runner. He runs side to side. If he has to take on linemen, that's not really his forte. Um, unless they can figure out a way to hide him. If he's just taking on guards all, all day long, I just don't think that's really playing to his strengths. But I, we'll see. Let me ask you about the Bucks a little bit here. You know, a couple of years ago, this guy's not doing anything, and he's going on to his fourth team when he signs with the Bucks, and that's Baker Mayfield. I mean, what what a transformation, you know? I mean, Ian, he goes from being like a third, fourth team guy in Los Angeles with Sean McVay. Now he signs a three year, hundred million dollar contract. The Bucks probably didn't want to restart the whole cycle again at quarterback and didn't really get comfortable with the people that were in the draft. I mean, um, what did you make of the signing of – re-signing of Baker Mayfield and giving him that contract extension? Well, last year when the Bucks signed Baker Mayfield, I mean, my sentiment was, listen, if we get anything from this guy, it's, it's a positive because we had to get $4 million, okay? Nobody was making $4 million a quarterback at the time. So, you know, we got him off a trash heap. And, and that's what I said. I said, we're getting this guy off a trash heap. You know, what can you expect? And people are like, well, you didn't think. I was telling you the way it was, okay? I was telling you what Baker Mayfield was. And what he was was a, a huge project. If anybody was in the Baker Mayfield camp, and there was a lot of people, that's fine. I don't think you could have imagined him playing that well. I just, even if you were a fan of Baker Mayfield, he played his ass off last year. His statistics were better than Tom Brady's in his last year. Tom Brady wouldn't have played better than Baker Mayfield last year in the same situation. I'm to a point where if we had had that Baker Mayfield the year before, the Bucks would have been better than they were with Tom Brady because Tom Brady was at the end of it. Now, I am I seem crazy for saying that because I... No, no, I, you're right. I know it's right, but you never would have thought that two, three years ago. But Baker Mayfield helped make this Buccaneer a playoff team last year, and the Bucs are in a situation where... Now he's not a $4 million quarterback anymore. He's a $30-something million quarterback, and we'll see if he's worth it. At $4 million, is a steal of the year. At $33 million, you're going to have to play better than last year, and I'm not sure he's capable. But if you told me right now he's going to play exactly like he played last year, I would take it right now. Help me out on Todd Bowles. I'm from afar, and again, Ian, I'm not on top of the Bucks anymore like you are when you cover them you know, on a, on a daily basis. And I look at Todd Bowles and I see a Tony Dungy type of guy, a guy who's not going to get too high and a guy who's not going to get too low. And when you're a player, let the players be emotional. I don't want my head coach to be emotional. And when you guys were at the beginning of the year, because the Eagles beat them pretty handily, then at the end of the year, the Bucks beat the Eagles handily. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's coaching in my opinion. And I love Todd Bowles. And I'm glad that the Glazers, Jason Light, they didn't move on from him. Are you? Well, you know, I, I do a podcast in the trenches and I talk about Todd Bowles quite often. And I find myself defending him too much, okay? Because, listen, I'm not a fan of anybody. I just evaluate people and that's it. I don't know Todd Bowles. If he walked in this room, I, I would say, hey, Todd, how you doing? I don't know him. I saw Jason Light the other day. I said to Jason Light, hey, buddy, I think you're doing a fantastic job. There's times where I was eviscerating Jason Light, and he deserved it. But if you look at Todd Bowles and what he's done throughout the years, 
I don't know how anybody would not be a fan. I really don't. I mean, I think everybody wants the Sean McVeighs and the Sean Paytons and all these, you know, colorful cats that roll the... How about somebody that the players are playing for? And to me, Todd Bowles, like you said, this team clearly improved as the year went on. I don't think this team was that talented last year, but they certainly were playing hard for somebody. And Todd Bowles, to me, gets as, as much as you can out of as little as he has. And right now, I'm not sure we could be in better hands than Todd Bowles. Are they going to win a Super Bowl? I'm not sure they have enough talent. But are they good hands with Todd Bowles? I say 100%. You know, Ian, I think, you know, I didn't realize this until I looked it up, like, midway through the year last year when it came to what Mike Evans has done. I didn't realize that Mike Evans, every year he's been in the league, has bad, had 1,000 yards. He's on his way to Canton. There was a conversation, I think maybe someone threw it out there, that the Bucks were going to move on from him and they were going to let him go somewhere. And I'm like, why would you let one of the top three receivers in the league go? He's still great. He's still performing. And now that you had Mayfield come back, I think the signing of Mike Evans, bringing him back, I think that was just collateral when it came over to having to sign Baker Mayfield, because if it, you don't sign Evans, you're not signing Mayfield. Do you agree? Well, there's, I believe in this one word called karma. Okay. If they didn't re-sign Mike Evans, I'm not sure the karma would be right. You know, yeah. Mike Evans, I'm wrong about, and I say when I'm wrong, I, I'm wrong often. I've been on the radio and I've been on doing podcasts forever. I've been wrong about Mike Evans probably for the last four years. Every year I have to say the same thing. Well, you can't expect Mike Evans to be the same guy. And he's the same guy every year. <laughs> so going into this year, my mentality is you can't keep on doing this. But if Mike Evans has another great year, once again, I won't be shocked. I just think if the Bucks didn't have Mike Evans this year, it would have been a bad feel. It would have felt like the, the rebuilding year. And as long as Mike Evans is on the field, as long as Levante David, who was resized back on the field, now we have Baker Mayfield. You're going to see a lot of Evans and Mayfield and Levante David jerseys. It's not going to feel like we're rebuilding. We're not going to win a Super Bowl this year. It's probably not going to happen. But we have a chance. And there's not a lot of other teams that going into the season can say, hey, we have a chance, and we're one of them. A couple last questions for you, Ian. Um, Bucks needs in the draft. You know, I love Via Veda. And obviously now that you lose White, linebacker, would you say, on that side of the ball, or maybe offensive line on the other side of the ball would be a need for the Bucks. Well, I mean, I'm always a trenches guy, Dan. You know that. That's where the games are won. Um, Vita Vea, I'm going to say this about Vita Vea. Sometimes I love him, sometimes I don't. Huh. Because, first of all, he's not always present. He misses too many games. Your boy Warren Sapp, you brought up earlier, when he drafted, when we drafted Vita Vea, he looked, he, we had a conversation the next day, and he said, Beck, he'll never play 16 games at that size. And I'm not sure he has. So, Vita Vea needs to stay healthy. He's banged up too much. And, you know, you got to be there for 17. That's, that's, yeah. To me, if you're great, you got to be there for 17. I played with Brooks and Sapp and those guys that were there all the damn time. As far as needs go, uh, I like to see the Buccaneers maybe. They could use some more speed, tight end, running back. I mean, there's nothing we don't really need. I mean, you got to start thinking about tomorrow on quarterback and how high do you go. Clearly, Kyle Trask is not the guy, clearly, or else we'd have seen him a little bit. So they got to start thinking about the future of their quarterback because, you know, you can't expect Baker Mayfield to be the guy three years from now. So I don't know there's a position the Buccaneers don't need at this moment. Let me get your take on Jalen Hurts. You saw him twice last year. Um, had kind of a walk back year last year. 18 turnovers. And, and Ian, go with me on this, or maybe you're not going to. I say this about dual threat quarterbacks. I don't think you can win a Super Bowl with these guys. Because to me, I think there's a ceiling. Either it's a health ceiling or it's a predictability ceiling. I think Lamar Jackson, when you throw the ball 47 times, LeBar Jackson's not winning a Super Bowl if he throws the ball 47 times. That guy's got to use his wheels. And to me, I think it's a hit-miss proposition on what a guy does year-to-year -year versus that seven-step guy. A seven-step guy 
you've got to win a Super Bowl from the pocket. Or in your opinion, has that thinking changed? Um, I'm, I kind of agree with you, Dan, as far as, you know, that run first mentality. It's not so much the game planning against it is physically you run out. I mean, like Cam Newton is the only quarterback that really took his team to the quarter to the Super Bowl running the football. He, I can't think of any other that did it. Now, when he got there, he was out of gas. I mean, that's too many hits to take. Josh Allen, every time I watch the Buffalo Bills play, I go, man, this guy's a talent, but he gets tackled too much. There's something about a quarterback getting tackled to me that just makes me cringe. I always saw Peyton Manning get tackled five times in his whole career. You know, that, like, that's how you preserve yourself. Baker Mayfield, the one knock I had on him, you, you're doing too much. Baker Mayfield, when he was in Cleveland, all I remember him is having, you know, straps around his shoulders and he's a beat-up warrior. I don't want my quarterback to be a beat-up warrior. I want my quarterback to make good decisions. And Lamar Jackson, uh, that's great in week 7, 8, 9, 10. But when week 17, 18, 19, 20 come, man, your wheels are gone, bro. And then you got to get back to you know, winning games in the pocket. And maybe you're not quite used to that. So I'm okay with the quarterback that runs like a Jalen Hurts, but don't get hit. Russell Wilson used to run, but not get hit. You just got to have that kind of happy median, and you just got to take care of these young guys because it's a long-ass season. Absolutely. Ian, it's been so great to catch up with you, my friend. I know you're an entrepreneur in that town, and you're revered, and I, I am so happy to reconnect with you here. Um, we used to see each other each and every single day. Ron, you, I think Ron, I know that's so always, always sure Ron liked me, but hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an appetite for certain people, you know, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure Ron liked me. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, I love you, man. Thank you, brother. One love, brother. Be good. You got it. Our dear friend, Ian Beckles. Love talking with him. All right, folks, do me a favor. Hit the like button. And don't forget also our March Madness event. Jacob Sports, we are looking for 500 folks and some of our loyal viewers and subscribers. We're teaming up with Underdog Fantasy. Now, look, it's simple. 10 bucks. That's it. You get 10 bucks, they're going to match your 10 bucks. Go all the way up to 100 bucks. Great friends at Underdog Fantasy are there for you during this March Madness tournament. Simple. All you do is use the promo code WIN, W-I-N. That's W-I-N. That's the promo code. Don't forget, Herm Edwards is going to join us at 4.30 Eastern time. We will have Randy Cross at 5.30. Keep it here, National Football Show.